Dogs of War by Erebus Esprit Let slip the dogs of war. Lord Marshal Valanth gave the order without emotion. He stood with his attendant, Colonel Merrick, on a gentle rise overlooking the plains below. The sun stood a hair's breadth above the black line of the horizon, washing the sky with amber light to complement the field of blood. Everywhere before the two officers, for as far as the sky stretched, men killed each other. Your jest, Lord Marshal, has served well to motivate the flagging competencies of the company officers. However, this seems hardly the time to take it further. The lanth ripped his gaze away from the battle and narrowed his eyes at the colonel. If there was a joke to be had, it had found its death at the hand of the Lenothians long ago. Colonel Merrick, a career officer who had stared down death a half dozen times, blanched at the full weight of Lord Marshal Valanth's attention. A runner appeared at the snap of his fingers. Let the Canid know that his pack has been ordered into the fight. Yes, sir. And where should they be sent? Colonel Merrick hesitated and looked at the battlefield. The Lenothians fought well. None could say otherwise. The gold and purple of their massive war banners were striking in the light of the setting sun, signaling their lack of fear, their dominance, their defiance to the bitter, bloody end. Their own forces, the red and black of Turin, seemed dark and dreary in comparison. They had neither the spirit nor the bite of the Lenothians, and were pushed back at every turn. Staring at the crash of men, Merrick was hard-pressed to identify any part of the battlefield where one squad could make a difference. The Lord Marshal had no such limitations. Captain knows his duty. He'll perform as he was trained. The runner threw a sharp salute to both officers, mounted his horse, and was gone, flying down the hillside at a breakneck pace. The foot of the hill contained the wagons and tents of the body of the Turin army. Smiths and Chirurgians, cooks and cobblers, and all the reserve units waited there, waited for orders to come from upon high to tell them the place and timing of their deaths. Not a man among them doubted it. The Lenothians fought with a fervent anger, each man empowered by his belief in their strange prophet. It was a question of when the Turin army would be overrun, not if. Men looked up as the runner rode past. Several stood, half drawing their swords as though the single horseman was a herald of an enemy cavalry charge. The runner ignored them, aimed for a single, large tent that stood away from the rest. He swung his legs neatly over the saddle and hit the ground, already moving toward the opening. Two guards stationed outside drew swords as he approached, each wearing a huge, wolf-like helmet that obscured their faces. Orders from the Lord Marshal! Let me pass! The guards did not step away, but neither did they stop the runner from entering. The runner walked inside to find three canids bent in quiet conversation. The runner shivered to look at them. Covered in dark fur with wolf-like faces, these canids were as apt to tear them apart as they were to fight for them. Broken and subjugated as they might be, the runner would certainly sleep more easily had High King Kulin ordered the damnable species put to the sword instead of the chain. One of the canids took a step toward him. It wore the cross sword insignia of a captain on the left breast of a crisp uniform. Is it time? The runner suppressed a shudder. To hear those growling words come from such unnatural lips was almost too much. The Turin may not have the god of the Lenothians, but to treat monstrous beasts with the respect reserved for men was as sure a reason as any for godly men to unite against them. Still, the Lord Marshal had given the order and the runner's duty was to relay it. Would any know if he lied? Would any care? The runner opened his mouth, but no words came out. He stared into the yellow eyes of the canid and felt it steal all powers of speech away from him. The damnable thing took another step toward him. Is it time, soldier? The runner's hand trembled. It itched for the knife on his belt. Monsters were for the slaying, weren't they? No one would miss these canids. They would be lost in the fog of war. If he let them loose upon the army, who knew how many Turins they would slaughter before they reached the enemy? He had every right, every duty to end it now. Surely the Lord Marshal would see the truth of it. The runner's fingers closed around the hilt of his knife. Before he could draw it, something grabbed his arm from behind, effectively immobilizing him. 
The cane had stood very close to him now, eyes squinting at him as though the runner himself was somehow less than human. He was to die now. He knew it. These monsters would kill him as surely as they would now go and kill more turns. Unbelievable. You think we were Lenothians with how they treat us? What do you want me to do with him, Captain? Put him on his horse and send him back, Corporal. We have our message. The runner felt himself be dragged from the tent and thrown belly first over the saddle. Only then did the pressure on his arm release. But before he could right himself and swing his leg over, the horse let out a loud whinny and started running. It was all he could do to hold on, grateful for every step that brought him away from those monsters. A brown-furred canid with a scar along his snout snorted at the runner's retreat. And they call us animals. That's enough, Lieutenant. We have enough enemies ahead without making more behind. Lieutenant threw a sharp salute and turned back to the table. Captain watched the runner go for a moment longer. Corporal, drive it. Come inside. We have a dark day ahead of us. The two masked canids entered the tent and took their place with the others. Captain looked them over. Each canid wore a clean uniform, neatly pressed with polished brass buttons and a rank insignia over their left breast. Private, Corporal, Sergeant, Lieutenant, and, of course, Captain himself. As sorry a squad as ever existed in the Turin army, but there was no time for that. Lord Marshal Volanth had given his orders, and Captain understood them well. The only question left was how. Captain leaned over the table and pointed a furry finger at a location on the map, behind a series of red blocks. This is the enemy headquarters. General Fulvin commands the Lenothian army from here. Our orders are to take him out by any means necessary. Standing between are ten thousand zealous soldiers. That's a bit too many for the five of us, Captain. Indeed it is, Private, which is why we're not going to fight them. Sergeant, a grizzled, older canid with gray fur tinging his snout, pointed to red blocks that formed the left and right flanks of the enemy army. Going to be hard to sneak around when they're surrounding us on both ends, Captain. We'll have to go back before we go forward. An extra six miles out of the way, I reckon. That's assuming, of course, as we don't run into any trouble on our side first. Private traced a line between the Lenothian headquarters and the Turin camp. We could dig a tunnel from our side to theirs. I doubt they'd see it coming. If we had two weeks to dig, sure. But something tells me the Grand Marshal Valant won't be willing to give us that much time. Right. Sorry, Corporal. So if we can't go around, can't go under, and can't go through, what's the plan? Load ourselves into a catapult and launch over their army? Captain stared at the map. The red blocks outnumbered the blue at least three to one, and by the black mood of the soldiers the last few days, the fighting had not gone well. Every day, each side flooded soldiers at one another seeking to gain some scant inches of ground before retreating with the setting sun. When night came, the wizards and magi of each side invoked their dark powers to rain death and devastation on the opposing sides. The land between the armies was a dead zone of dirt, sand, and ash, and each day it grew closer and closer to the Turin camp. More than a thousand soldiers had died in the three days since the fighting had started, and more joined them each hour. Lieutenant, what do you think? Lieutenant frowned. He had a white spot over one eye, marking it blue instead of the canid yellow of his other eye. It'll be full dark soon. We could use the cover of night, sneak through, take out the headquarters. Risky, but it'll be fast either way. Moonlight. Waxing crescent, sir, but still young. Should be low visibility. Weather. Sergeant sniffed the air. Storm's coming, should hit in the wee hours. The whole place will be mud by the time it's done. The captain turned the plan over in his mind, poking at it from different angles. Corporal, what potential problems do you foresee with the lieutenant's plan? Corporal swallowed. He stared at the map for several long moments. There's a lot of them I'll have to get through, sir. Very true. What else? Corporal stared at the map even harder but it was no wizard's parchment with appearing ink or hidden runes. I don't know, sir. Private. 
Scouts, sir? They might see us coming. True. Even with the low light, they might see us. Tell me, what are the demographics of the Lenothian army? Private blanched. I haven't a clue, Captain. Lieutenant? Mostly human, I think, sir. Sergeant? Entirely human, sir. The Lenothians don't harm non-humans. Their god won't allow it. Your average scout probably won't see us coming, but it's their magical support I'm worried about. Quite right. However, as we're trying to take out their headquarters, what is the enemy trying to do? Take out our headquarters, sir? Quite right, Private. They'll need light to see by. If we stick to the shadows and move quickly, they won't know we're there. It'll be dangerous, but doable. Ready your equipment, gentlemen. We leave at first dark. The rest of the Canids gave a salute and went to ready themselves. Captain stood before a heavy wooden chest and stared down at the locked lid. The lock was a tricky thing. Three sets of tumblers kept it shut tight, enough to dissuade even the pluckiest of thieves. The key hung from a cord around Captain's neck, a weight he barely noticed anymore, except for when he saw the chest. Is it that serious, then? Sergeant stood at his shoulder, staring at the chest with him. Captain knelt and fit the key into the lock. It would seem so. The lid opened to reveal a set of black armor. Captain pulled it out piece by piece. The metal was cold against his skin, unnaturally so in the sweltering heat of late evening. Below the armor, nestled into the straw, was a massive black blade. Sergeant shuddered at the sight of it and turned away. Captain left it where it was for the moment. He laced up the armor about himself, pulling the leather straps tight and tucking them in. He ratcheted the belt tight against his stomach, feeling a strange strength fill his arms. Then he lifted the sword out of the chest, held it for a moment, and placed it in a slot on his back. I don't like this, Captain. What better to send after a godly man than a hellhound? We have our orders, Sergeant. We must follow them. Yes, sir. Watch out for Lieutenant, will you? He's got a good head, but he's inexperienced. I will, sir. Good. Good. Captain left the tent with Sergeant at his left. The last tinge of purple touched the western sky. Time to begin. The rest of his unit were arrayed in front of him, donned with light armor and blades, things that wouldn't make much noise while running. Torches were lit throughout the camp, spreading sporadic light like fireflies across the valley. The sounds of battle faded as both sides retreated to lick their wounds and count their dead. Soon, the wizards would begin their arcane bombardments, lighting the sky with eldritch and celestial magic. Captain touched a symbol on his chest, and the shadows deepened around them, covering each member of his squad in turn. Hellhounds on me! Captain led the charge, lowering himself to all fours as he sprinted through the camp. Behind him, the rest followed, their steps making no noise in the soft soil, shrouded by concealing shadow. If any of the Turins saw them, they would chalk it up to the horrors of war, playing on their senses. They would tell their friends, and would take the light-hearted ribbing they would receive for speaking of moving shadows. The relief would last until the first fireball exploded over their heads, raining down flame and death on the fabric city below. When the sky bleeds fire, moving shadows are the very last of their worries. The soft mug grew thicker as they passed into the dead land between armies. Nearly a mile of corpses, blood, and ash stretched before them. The hopes of the living and dead alike were crushed underfoot as Captain Squad pressed forward. He pushed them hard, sprinting through the battlefield. They had precious few minutes before the barrage would light up the world, and they could not be caught in the dead land while that happened. A streak of light appeared high above, a second sun arcing across the sky, Men screamed and shouted orders. Everywhere, shields raised, people dove into the mud, and a chorus of cries went up, begging mothers, gods, and everything else to save them. The streaming ball of fire crested its arc and plummeted toward the ground, aimed for the Turin camp. In response, a line of stone-faced men and women raised staves and wands, chanting strange words of power with a single voice. Far above, the fireball exploded, sending magical fragmentation far and wide. 
Behind it, more streaks approached. Fire, ice, and eldritch machinations lit the sky with arcane destruction. Below it all, five canids dashed across a field of corpses. The line of Lenothian entrenchment approached. Crude, makeshift barriers demarcated the war camp from the battlefield, armed with spears to break an imaginary cavalry charge. Captain bounded over the line, landing on the other side without noise. A heartbeat later, Corporal landed beside him, followed by the rest. They paused, waiting for Captain's mark. The section of line was unguarded. In the days of fighting, neither side had advanced after the nightly withdrawal for arcane bombardment and days on end of battles won had made the Lenothians overconfident. When God has blessed your cause, victory is a matter of course. Lights farther ahead indicated where the Lenothians gathered, chow lines and blacksmiths, craftsmen and priests. Captain picked out a path of darkness amid the Lenothian camp and, without a word, set off. The Canids were shadows throughout the Lenothian camp, footing from darkness to darkness. Overhead, the Turins had repelled the initial offensive and reposted with a volley of their own. A meteor swarm barreled toward the Lenothian encampment, threatening to drown everything in stone and fire, only to be blown apart by a shielding sigil three miles above the ground. Dirt pelted the ground like rain, eliciting a groan from the soldiers of both sides as it toppled tents and ruined uncovered stewpots. Soldiers kept their eyes downcast to avoid taking a rock to the face. Captain was about to cross an open stretch of field between two lines of tents when a Lenothian soldier crawled out of the tent flap next to him, yawned, and pulled down his trousers. A stream of yellow hit the ground not ten feet away. Captain looked around, trying to find somewhere to hide, but there was little time. The rest of his squad was arraigned behind him. They could not afford to stay still, where the chances of being caught grew by the moment. Captain's hand itched toward the blade strung across his back. One quick slash, stow the body inside the tent, and continue. Simple. The stream grew weak, and the soldier grunted, fiddling with his drawstrings. Private rushed forward, past Captain's shoulder, and latched his mouth onto the soldier's neck. The Lenothian gave a surprised squeak, but Private had him fast. They both fell to the ground, struggling to gain purchase on each other. Captain was there a moment later, pinning the soldier's arms behind his back as Private twisted and pulled doing his best to keep the snarling to a minimum. Blood sprayed the grass, black on black, and the Lenothian twitched as he died. Corporal and Private grabbed the corpse and hauled it into the tent. Captain stared at the bloodstain on the ground. A bloodstain on a battlefield was not so strange, all things considered, but it was still a risk of causing an alarm. They would have to keep moving. Once Corporal and Private reappeared, they were off again, running through the camp, the Lenothian headquarters was situated on a rise, where they could see the entirety of the battlefield spread before them. It was remarkably similar to the Turin headquarters, some four miles away. A large tent, a score or so of soldiers posted to protect the officers inside. Self-important men in pristine uniforms, who told their forces when, where, and how to die. Captain wasn't sure where the difference between the Turins and the Lenothians lay. Whether it was a monarch or a bishop, Men with strange hats were very effective at making others kill. Still, far be it from him to disobey the word of the Lord Marshal. He had his orders. Captain crested the rise, ten thousand Lenothian soldiers at his back, twenty or so at his front. Five were messengers, swords belted at their waists, but not much else. Their real threat was the horses that stood nearby, saddled and ready to ride should new orders be given. The messengers likely weren't capable fighters, but they could spread the word of an attack on the headquarters more effectively than a klaxon. One of the horses caught their scent. Eyes and nose flared as it stamped and hissed its displeasure. The messenger closest to it grabbed hold of its reins, trying to calm it, but it refused to quiet. Behind them were a dozen guards, gathered loosely around a brazier in front of the headquarter entrance. The nights were cold and long and each man pressed elbows into his neighbor as he tried to rub the feeling back into his hands. The odds weren't good. Their chance of taking out everyone without raising the alarm was even less so. Sergeant pressed his way forward, stopping just next to Captain. What's the plan? 
Kill the horses. You four engage the rest. I'll slip in and kill four of them. Not telling how many are inside. I know. Very well. On your mark, Captain. Captain locked eyes with Private and pointed at the horses. Private nodded and pulled out a blowpipe, then carefully unwrapped a set of darts from a leather casing. He loaded a single dart and took aim. The frightened horse had made the other four nervous. One of them let out a low hinny as the dart landed in its flank. It stamped, pulling at its reins. Head moved left and right as it sought out the danger it could smell, eyes wide with panic. Then it began to slow. The attending messenger cursed at it in a soft voice, completely oblivious to the cause of its distress, but annoyed nonetheless. Annoyance turned to concern as the horse sank to its knees, then rolled over onto its side. Concern turned to panic as the other four horses did the same. The poison in Private's blowgun made their deaths quick and painless. A mercy in war. The other messengers started up at the sight of their horses lying in the dust. Their confused and worried muttering drew the attention of the guards. Captain kept low to the ground, one hand raised, holding back the members of his warband. He waited until a quarter of the guards had reluctantly abandoned the brazier and wandered over to see what the commotion was. Then he let his hand fall. The warband swept over the ground, unseen in the dark night. They crossed the twenty yards to the horses, blades painted black held in tight fists. A fireball erupted in the sky, scattered by a targeted arcane offense. The hill was plunged into daylight for a single moment. Man stared at Canid, too shocked to register what was happening until the blades pierced the gaps in their armor. Four men, three guards and a messenger, fell beneath the Canid's blades. One man shouted, then the unmistakable sound of drawn steel drew everyone's attention. Captain left his squad to their work and moved to the tent. The fabric was thick and taut, but it caught the point of his dagger easily enough. In the work of a moment, he cut an entrance for himself, slipping in unnoticed amid the chaos outside. Three guards stood by the entrance, spears raised toward it in the muffled den. Three officers and a dozen attendants stood around a table, shouting at each other in the Lenothian tongue. Centermost among them was Captain's target. General Fulvin did not wear the uniform that came with his position. Though he commanded the Lenothian army, it was hardly how he would describe himself. First and foremost, he was a man of God, a divine appointment to conduct divine work on the mortal plane. Fulvin was not arrogant enough to believe he was foremost among the priesthood. Surely that honor resided with the bishop. But he, like any high priest, would make sure that God knew his name. His prayers were the loudest, and he would make sure not even God could ignore his sacrifices. Every man that died on the battlefield was his offering. Every man was his gift to the divine. It was here that he sowed the seeds of his plans. The bishop was an old man, and though most beloved by God, was growing frailer and feebler by the day. Soon, God would take the bishop into his loving embrace, and choose among the loyal a replacement a new instrument with which to conduct his work. Fulvin would make sure his name was foremost on God's lips if he had to drown the countryside in bloody sacrifices. An attendant was the first to spot Captain. A pointed finger, a squeak of strange words, and all eyes drew to him. Disgust was plain on each man's face, but it was nothing new to Captain. Disgust, hatred, discomfort. Men died the same no matter what emotions roiled beneath their emotive flesh. The three guards by the entrance whirled and spread out to surround him, interposing themselves between him and the rest of the staff. Captain didn't move, didn't draw his blade. Even his dagger was safely stowed. General Fulvin snarled something in Lenothian, but seeing no response from Captain, waved a hand dismissively. The three guards stepped forward. The mind of a man is a strange thing. It can convince itself of realities completely inconsistent with the world around it capable of dismissing anything it deems as lesser. When confronted by an irrefutable fact perpendicular with a truth it holds dear, the mind reels, unable to marry the two. This collision creates a schism, a great void that the mind must bridge, lest it risk shattering, for it cannot hold two opposite truths without compromise or concession. The greater the gap, the greater the mind must be to overcome it. The minds of the guards were not remarkable, so it took each one of them quite a while to realize that they had died. 
a torn-out throat is not easily dismissed, even if it is hard to accept. The staff officers shuffled back, horror stamped across their features. It was strange how easy men were to read. Every thought was written in the lines of their face. The Lord Marshal was the only man Captain had ever known to completely mask his intentions. It was very canid. General Fulvan did not shrink back with the rest of his staff, but he did stare on in annoyance. In my country, there is a small county in the northeast that raises sheep with wool as soft and white as the souls of God's chosen. Each is butchered after its virgin shear and its meat burned in sacrifice. Only those that God has deemed worthy are allowed to take the fleece into their possession. You have ruined it with spilled blood. Captain reached for the sword across his back. The Lenothian god meant nothing to him, as did these men. He had his orders. That was higher power enough. Two junior officers ran toward him, cavalry sabers rattling high. Captain drew out his sword, the flat blade twice as wide as a man's hand, and again twice as long as the sabers. With one hand, he brought it to bear against the two officers. Blade met blade, and the latter gave way. Metal screeched and sheared. Vibrations rattled up Captain's arm. But that was all. Two men fell to the ground in four pieces, their blood joining that of the other three on the fleece rug. Every life you end is both honor and insult to God, Hound. You are nothing but a herald of our eternal reward, an instrument through which God acts. But by form you are abomination. Behold! the holy light of God, and weep, that you may know beauty before the end. Fulvan raised a hand, and golden light scattered from it, filling the room, weight pressed against Captain's limbs, shackling him in place. Light condensed around each of the officers in turn, forming breastplates and swords in their hands, divine protection and retribution. Three stepped forward, triumph leering, and Captain stepped forward as well. The weight pressed against him, but it was a weight he knew well. Fulvan blinked, confidence sapped from his face, replaced by confusion. You are abomination incarnate, monstrosity and the shape of man. God's judgment should have destroyed you. Captain swung his mighty blade three times, and three more bodies fell to the ground. Four officers broke for the entrance of the tent, and Captain let them leave. Two more tripped over the table and each other, sowing chaos. A lantern fell, shattering against the ground and setting the fabric of the tent ablaze, but Captain's eyes remained on Fulvan. The general produced a spear of solid light. God will anoint me as his agent upon the world. All will know his light by my hand. Face his judgment, monster. Dark blade met light, and both rebounded. The force shattered a support beam, and the conflagrated fabric fell, burying all who remained inside. Captain held the sword high, and it pierced through the heavy fabric before the rest bore him down. His head cracked the ground, and the sword fell from his grasp. Weariness gripped him, and he lost all sense of time and direction. Flames licked at him, barely more than a tickle, but breathing did not come easy. Then the pressure on his chest lifted, and hands gripped his shoulders, pulled him upright. Something cracked against the side of his face, and vision and sense returned. Sergeant gripped him by the breastplate, shouting, covered in blood. Sound came a moment later, a pop followed by a dull roar. Men shouted, screamed, raged. Magic shrieked as it tore through the night. Miles away, barely visible, the hilltop that held Turin's headquarters had become a smoking crater. The Lenothian's magical barrage had finally broken through the arcane shielding. Your order, sir! Captain tore his gaze away from the Turin encampment and looked at his sergeant. Take the others and mount to retreat. Deliver a report to whoever is left in charge. General Fulvan of the Lenothian army is dead, and their leadership in shambles. Is he, sir? He will be. Captain lifted his dreadful sword and turned to see a figure wreathed in golden light 
burst from the burning remnants of the tent, lifted into the air on wings of flame, passion and rage incarnate. Captain? Now! The warband fractured. Corporal took Private onto his shoulders and hauled the younger cannon along. Sergeant drove his short blade into a soldier's face as Lieutenant pointed the route for them to take. As one, they were off, moving through the shadows to avoid the press of soldiers making their way to the headquarters. You're too late, monster. Your masters are dead. Your lands and people will follow. Captain watched his squad slip through the darkness and out of sight. Soldiers massed at the base of the hill, shouting orders and organizing a response. None of it mattered now. His squad would make it to safety. Lord Marshal Valanth was dead. The Turin army would be in disarray, but it didn't matter. Orders were orders. General Fulvin streaked toward him, a paragon in light and flame. His spear touched Captain's breastplate, and the air went still around them. Light met dark in an event horizon that consumed them both. The world turned thin and gray, becoming pale and translucent like a fading dream. The flames smothering Fulvin died, then the light died as well, his spear blinking out of existence. Captain's armor fell away into nothingness, followed by his sword. The two stood outside of time, a changeless world. What sacrilege is this? Captain looked at the ground, the sky, the soldiers. Nothing moved, nothing breathed, nothing lived. They were gone. Life and death had become one, and neither held sway. Captain closed his eyes. It was not his plan, but orders were orders, and he had done his part. O oh God, who holds all power, deliver your faithful servant from this place, that I may bring your righteousness to the world. Flood it in your light. Free me from this hellish prison. But Fulvin remained. His prayers wheedled, then pled, then raged. But there was no deliverance. He knelt and prostrated and stomped the ground. His voice swelled and withered in turn. I am abandoned. I don't understand. Captain took a breath and felt the crushing weight of responsibility drift. Here, he was neither owned nor owner. Slave, soldier, master, pet. All were equally meaningless here. The captain was meaningless as well. He existed, but he didn't. He was, but he wasn't. Not all meaning is lost here. Captain turned and found a new figure walking toward him, over the remains of the Lenothian headquarters. Tall, with disproportionately long arms and legs, the figure was well-dressed, presenting as a well-tailored courtier, except for the mask on his face. It was featureless, except for two large holes for eyes. The holes were massive, completely encapsulating in their nothingness. It was all Captain could do to not become lost in them. From a pocket, the figure retrieved a golden apple. It seemed the only bit of color left in the world. With a deft flick of thumbs, the apple fell into six slices. The figure picked one up between thumb and forefinger, tilted their head back, and dropped the slice into their eye hole. I am the judge. The figure stopped ahead of Captain and dropped another apple slice into their eye hole. I used to be Captain. The judge tilted their head to the side. I judge you are Captain still. This place does strange things to you, but you have proved that much. What manner of devil are you? The Turans will pay for this blasphemy! The judge did not move, did not stir, did not even breathe. Fulvin simply ceased to be. Captain gazed upon the place the general used to occupy, but emotion was as meaningless as all else. For some, judgment is easy. For others, it is not. Tell me, Captain, what is it that you want? Wanting is pointless. I told you before, not all meaning is lost here. I am owned. It is not my place to want. I am a captain. My duty is to serve. The judge dropped another apple slice into their eye. You are a keen in service to Lord Marshal Valanth, deceased three minutes ago. 
In Volant's final testament are explicit instructions regarding your immediate freedom and signed documentation of your retirement with full military honors. You are your own wolf, Captain. Your kingdom thanks you for your service. The judge gave a salute, made mockery by the length of their arms. The barest flicker of Captain's tail was all the reaction in the world. What meaning does freedom have here? It is a place like any other. Do you want to go back? Captain did not answer. In truth, what really awaited him? Meaning was not lost, but he had lost all meaning. No further orders would arrive. He was not captain, but a captain still. My squad, what will become of them? Under lieutenant's command, they will return to the Turin field. Make the report to Colonel Nell, who will assume command by royal decree in three days' time, and be pulled back to the capital while the rest of the army makes a mess of things here. Many more men will die pointlessly, and the Lenothian advance will be slowly pushed back over the next eight months. Mages will be credited with the destruction of the Lenothian headquarters and the death of General Fulvin, as cover for their utter failure to repel the Lenothian attack against the Turin headquarters and the death of Lord Marshal Bolan. Captain felt a tremor in his leg. The judge cocked their head and slipped another apple slice into their eye. What will become of me? What do you want, Captain? Captain thought of his life, trained in soldiering since he was a pup. His first memory was his hand, nicked on a blade. He learned strategy from then Major Valanth, who treated him as manservant. He received his commission and name in a moment of rage, a freedom in a cage together. He was given a squad of Canids to lead as no man could submit to a Canid's orders. He fought, he bled, he fought again, but always under orders. What orders would Captain give himself? To live free? To grow? To love? These things were meaningless, as alien to him as the men that gave him orders. Send me where you judge I am needed. The judge quickly pressed the rest of the apple slices into their eye holes and clapped their hands together. The world shifted and blurred, and Captain was gone. The Winothian soldiers charged up the hill toward the wreckage of the headquarters. They picked through the carnage, rolled the dead bodies over, but they found no sign of General Fulvin or the assassins. Three staff officers screamed at one another, each demanding that they were next in line, next to most beloved by God next most qualified to destroy the godless turns. The fighting continued. Days turned into weeks, weeks turned into months. Months dragged on until three quarters of a year had dwindled by. But Captain did not return to the war. It was, perhaps, the fastest military burial service in the history of the country. A ceremony for a deceased Canid? There was a war on. Still, Emotionless men in expensive garments pressed ink against parchment, copied it thrice, and sealed each with wax. Captain was a free canid, the first in a generation. If only he weren't quite dead. Unmistakably dead. A shame, really. Not all was lost, though. Deep in a kingdom to the east, one that had not heard of Turin or Lenothia, a dark-furred canid opened a door to a cabin he had built with his own hands. Pinned against the mantle was a strange insignia. A captain's insignia. <laughs>